Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co. And I've been thinking recently about the concept of accessibility in board games. Just the idea of making board games accessible. And this, this video is inspired by two different things, both represented, well, here. We have Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, which is another campaign game. It's a game that has a campaign, and I would have brought its older brother Gloomhaven to the table, except for the fact that, well, I don't have enough space for Gloomhaven and this box, which leads us to the second thing, which is going to be this box over here is going to be the Too Many Bones Trove Chest. And honestly, the Too Many Bones base game would have been enough to have this discussion. I just have the Trove Chest, so I brought this out to the table. And it's going to be inspired by those two concepts, by, by this campaign game and then by this expensive deluxe board game product that is amazing, one of my favorite games of all times, but expensive. And I'll start with a shout out to Too Many Bones, to Chip Theory Games specifically, because, and this is something I mentioned one video before already, but I saw a recent interaction between someone commenting on the recent Burn Cycle campaign about the fact that they love the, they want to try Chip Theory Games, but they've priced them out of the range of the average gamer. And Chip Theory Games was nice enough to say, hey, send us your address, we'll send you a copy of Too Many Bones, which is a beautiful thing on their part. Completely not the point of this video, but it is a beautiful gesture on their part of basically someone who felt rejected, someone who felt on the outside. They said, hey, come on in, come on in, we hear you, we hear you. Now, obviously not every person who complains about the price of a Chip Theory Games is going to get a copy of Too Many Bones, but the right person, the right time, the feeling of frustration, the feeling of being left out was enough to trigger a reaction of someone reaching out in frustration and getting a warm hug back from Chip Theory Games, which is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. But it led me to think about the concept of accessibility in board gaming. And that, combined with the fact that I regularly harp in my videos about the fact that campaign games are already a strike against the game when I am looking at a page. When I'm looking at a Kickstarter page, or retail as well, but Kickstarter is more where I tend to find these, and I see campaign game, 50 hours of content, or anything along those lines, I consider it a strike against the game. And someone commented, that's not a strike against the game. Just because you have too many games doesn't mean that game is a bad game. And I was like, no, 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 of course. You are 100% right. It doesn't mean it's a bad game. It's a strike against the game for me, not for other people. For me, it's a strike against the game because it makes the game less accessible. And to that end, we already have two of the seven different points I'm going to touch upon in this video. We have price and we have accessibility because of campaign. These are both barriers to entry in board games, and there are others, and I try to think through what are the various barriers to entry? What are the various things that make a game not accessible to one person versus another? And because price will readily be something that we understand, that game is too expensive, that Kickstarter with its all deluxe whatever and $250 all in, you are pricing yourself out of the range of most people. You have made your game less accessible through the price of that game. And we understand that. And for me, primarily, while price is, of course, a factor as well, the bigger one for me often is the campaign game nature of things, where you have too many campaign games and I don't have enough time or energy. Well, energy I have. I just don't have enough time. All the things I'm trying to fit into my life. I don't have enough time to dive into 50 hours of content on six different board games. If I go through my own games and the most played, I mean, while I do play a lot of games, I play over 800 games a year or something like that. I don't know exact number of hand but I don't play a lot of games 50 hours. There's a few games that are even close to that. I don't know if any game has crossed 50 hours in 2020. And so for me, campaign games are going to be an accessibility issue. When you say this is a 50 hour experience, you have made your game less accessible to me. And so let's go through those seven things. To begin with, like I said already, price. If you make your game too expensive, there is a trade-off. Now that doesn't mean that it's a bad thing at all. The upside of Too Many Bones is you get a deluxified experience. You look at all any of these deluxe miniatures or deluxified upgrades or whatever it is on Kickstarter, they are giving you a premium experience. There is a trade-off at play here. But in doing so, they have also made the game less accessible by pricing people out. For me, like I said already, it's going to be campaign games and or game length. That's going to tie in together. And campaign games, like I said already, 50 hours of content is amazing. That's incredible. That's a counter to the price. So fine, this game is 100 bucks, but you get 50 hours of content. That's incredible. But I like variable experiences more than I like diving deeply into a single one. 
my favorite games I play a lot. But most games, most games don't see 50 hours of gameplay for me. And so when I see that, it's not the price that scares me away. More often than not, it's the, the degree of content that I feel is likely essential to a degree for me to truly optimize my experience of that game. Will that experience in its potential 50 hours, will it be as good if I only give it 6 hours? Is it worth it if I only give it 6 hours? And so for me, campaign is going to be an accessibility issue. And tied into that one, tied in with campaign, is game length. Twilight Imperium, it's 6 to 8 hour game. Inherent in the game design is an accessibility trade-off. Again, all these things come out of pros and cons. The pros are all, not always obvious to measure, but they're always there. The pro of a game like Twilight Imperium is the fact that it is so incredibly rich of an experience. That eight hours opens the door for an experience you can't get out of a two-hour game. At least I assume. I've never played it. What do I know? But I assume. Because I can tell you that my three-hour games tend to be immensely more rewarding than my half-an-hour-long games. But there is an accessibility trade-off in that design choice. Next up is going to be point number three, representation. Representation is a real concept in games, and this is something we recently saw with Bardsung with the, the pendulum swinging in the opposite direction, where in Bardsung they made the design choice to make most of the heroes women, which got a little bit of outrage or pushback, not outrage, so I got a little bit of pushback from people who want to see more men in the game, and I understand that feeling of wanting to be represented. I understand wanting to play a male character, and that's probably a feeling that many women have felt when they played games that had all male characters. That goes both ways, and you, you, I under, I'm not saying you should have all female characters, and I disagree with that, frankly, but don't be so upset or be more understanding of the other side. Representation in games matters. That's going to go for gender. That's going to go for skin color. It's going to go for any number of different factors that make someone feel in a game that they are there. And the trade-off there is usually one of two things. Sometimes it's just people not thinking. Other times it can be you know, overwhelming to have to design a, a male this, a female that, a male female skin color that, or this. You can, you can start getting complicated, but that's, to an extent, it's a weak excuse because if you have enough stuff, people are not going to complain that you don't have everything. They understand that. So representation in games is going to be an accessibility factor. It's going to be a limiting factor in people's desire or willingness to get one game over another. Number four is going to be theme. And this is one where, I mean, again, it's just a trade-off because you need to have a theme. In a, we don't need to have a theme. You often want to have a theme in a game because a theme might draw someone in. You throw zombies on your box and people are buying that thing up. And other people are saying, well, zombies. I mean, I'm kind of sick and tired of zombies. So, you know, theme and theme and the mechanics will fall into this one as well. It's going to be theme and mechanics. The idea that a design choice around what the game is targeting, a deck building zombie attack, that sounds amazing. Unless you don't like zombies and you don't like deck building. A, a drafting cowboy western theme? That's awesome. Unless you don't like drafting and you don't like westerns. So your theme and mechanics, the very design choices that go into the game, inherently as they bring you pros to the game, as they bring you reasons why people might back them, they also give other people reasons not to back them or buy them. I realize I use the term back instead of buy because that's what I talk about most of the time. And so theme and mechanics are going to be number four. Number five is an interesting one with a different kind of trade-off. And that's going to be language. Language, meaning the language options a game has. You can make your game, ideally, in a perfect world, you make your game a non-word, I can't remember the term, but basically where there's no, it's was icon, icon, iconography. You make it iconography so that you don't need words in the game and therefore it's accessible to any degree of anyone. But that's not always possible. And so the question is there is, great, you have Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, how many different languages are you printing it in? Because that's an obvious accessibility blocker to any number of different people. Now, the trade-off there is practicality. It's not always easy to make a game in different languages, especially if you don't have the popularity of a game like Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. It's easy to want a game printed in every language. It's a different story to actually get that done. You need to pay people. You need to have different distribution models. You need to have different partners. It's harder. It's frankly just harder to do. Is there a trade-off to not doing it? Yeah, people can't get your game. People who don't have that language accessibility to whatever languages the game is printed in, they... they won't or can't get your game. It is a trade-off like everything else on this list. Point number six is going to be a distribution model. And this is going to be where we heavily talk about Kickstarter exclusives or Kickstarter as a distribution model. Because inherently there's a trade-off there as well. When you make your game Kickstarter exclusive, there's a good chance that people will back that game. And there's often a trade-off as to why you do it. Sometimes your game is so expensive in terms of the production of what you're offering at the price point that you can't add two layers of, of people in there. You can't add distributors and retailers in there because you're, you, you wouldn't have, you'd have to charge more money. It just wouldn't work. 
And so you make your game Kickstarter exclusive. You say, this game, Dead Reckoning, it's Kickstarter exclusive. You can't get the game. Yeah, otherwise, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And there's a trade-off. The price is a trade-off, but the accessibility comes at the cost. People can't get it if it's not on, if they weren't there at the time, or they have to pay a premium on the aftermarket. The way you choose to distribute your game is also going to be an accessibility question. Come on, cool many or not with all their games that they, they have a retail version that goes to retailers and then they have their, here's all the extras version that goes on Kickstarter. That's awesome. I love that. I think it's great. They give me a reason to back instead of waiting. And that's awesome for me because I follow Come on. But it's not awesome for the person who comes late to the party. There is, like everything else in this list, a trade-off to the decision they are making. They are giving people a reason to back now. They are making people feel exclusive. They're making people feel rewarded. And then they're making other people feel left out. And it's unfortunate. And and no, at no point in almost anything in this list am I actually volunteering an opinion of what you should do. They are all trade-offs that I understand. The only one that I think is likely what you should do is representation. The rest of them are really just a question of who you're trying to make happy at the cost of someone else. The accessibility issue is going to be present in every single one of these trade-offs. And that brings us to number seven. Number seven is one that we also have seen a, a shift, a pivot in, in recent years. And that's going to be player count. Player count is an accessibility issue like any other. A game that plays well at two players, a game that plays two players exclusive, let's say, versus a game that plays two to four, that is going to be an accessibility question of who gets to get that game. If your game group is rarely ever two players, you've just knocked everyone in that category out of the equation. And then the most recent one, the one we've seen a pivot in in recent years, the past two years, has become a new thing. We never used to see this to this degree, is the idea of throwing solo play into almost every board game, or as many as they can. Because solo play is, again, like everything else, COVID or not, it's an accessibility issue. When you give solo play in your games, you have opened the gates to that game being available to other people, people who would never have otherwise gotten that game. So many of us are blessed and fortunate to have game groups, game groups that we can play with people, we can benefit, we can have fun. And then there are people who love this hobby as much as you and I, but they don't always have the game group available. And so being in a Facebook group, talking about their game, showing pictures, saying, I managed to beat this score in Terraforming Mars, that ends up being the social interaction and the gameplay interaction they are looking for. And without a solo mode, they can't do that. And again, the trade-off part. The trade-off part of that conversation is you have to design a solo mode. You have to make a solo mode that doesn't feel tacked on because I would argue the only thing worse than a game with no solo mode is a solo mode that's tacked on. Don't, don't try to pretend it plays well with one if it doesn't. Again, trade-offs. Everything in this list is a trade-off. And that's, that's really it. There's no giant takeaway here. I was just thinking about the concept of accessibility, inspired by too many bones, inspired by my aspect of thinking about campaign games, that price and campaign aspect of how they play out in the decisions we make. And how there's always a trade-off because what's appealing to one person is not appealing to another. You can make Too Many Bones a significantly cheaper game by compromising on a lot of the design choices they've made. And then many others wouldn't want it. You can take Gloomhaven Jaws of the Line and make it a single-shot adventure. And it would lose its luster. There are always trade-offs in games. There are always trade-offs in life, in decisions, in everything we do. And often, those trade-offs, those decisions, will decide who gets our game, who doesn't get our game, who wants our game, who moves on. There's always a trade-off. And I just thought it was an interesting conversation. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I hope you have a good one.